Um, my name is Shay Kwan, and uh, I'll just briefly talk about Tendermint and Cosmos for a bit first. So Tendermint is a BFT consensus engine. It started in 2014, and uh, it brought um, BFT into this landscape of blockchains. So it's the most mature uh, and, and probably the most, one of the most advanced, if not the advanced, uh, consensus engines available today. It's a general purpose consensus system, so you can plug it into any framework. And uh, one of the frameworks that we've de developed on top of Tendermint to make it easy to program blockchains is called the Cosmos SDK. Now, if you develop your application on the Cosmos SDK, say uh, in Golang, then uh, you can import a library, uh, an IBC library, that gives you connectivity to the Cosmos hub. Uh, and that way you can transfer tokens between uh, blockchains, among blockchains, in a network of uh, side, -chained, uh, side chains. So that's what the Cosmos network is about. Um, so let's get to it. Uh, I want to start by talking about um, uh, various kinds of uh, scaling ideas around um, uh, between you know multiple types of blockchains, and then talk about the pros and cons of them, and, uh, and just talk about uh, some of the security issues and problems that arise. And, uh, and, and also kind of do a brain dump of, of the kind of uh, thinking and innovation that's happening today. Okay, so the first uh, uh, application, the first kind of interchain uh, interoperability uh, was uh, documented many years ago, and, and it's called atomic cross-chain transactions. Uh, so the idea is that there are two chains and you can atomically bind two transactions to happen at the same time uh, with, a, with a hash commit reveal scheme. Uh, so when, when one transaction succeeds, then you know that the other is going to succeed and therefore you can do uh, interesting things like have a token exchange between two blockchains. So I can give Alice uh, some food tokens and I'll know that I'll get bar tokens from Alice because uh, th these two transactions that are happening on two different chains are atomically bound uh, with a commit reveal scheme. Or you can use uh, notaries, so you can have multiple signers. Um, so the way that would work is you, you set up two transactions to, uh, uh, to complete only if the notaries um, say, okay, they press a button and say, these transactions are gonna go. Uh, so there are roughly two ways to make uh, atomic cross-chain transactions work. Um, now, something more interesting is uh, payment and state channels. So uh, we just heard about uh, uh, state channels with uh, uh, fault recovery through uh, dispute resolution by diving into the uh, operations to see, you know, okay, what should actually happen. But the general concept around um, these systems is that you have uh, generally bilateral parties. You come to agreement by mutually signing a checkpoint, uh, and then uh, you know. But you still have the issue of asynchronicity. So one of the parties might not be online, and so you'll have to settle the transaction uh, and go through some dispute mechanism. So the, you know the general point here is that there's always going to be an asynchronous problem whenever you're dealing with multiple parties. And so you need a way to recover. And so you need to structure the contract so that uh, even though this other party uh, might have signed, even though they decided maliciously to not reveal, there's not much damage that they can do because of that. Um, of course, you can also link uh, these kinds of channels across blockchains. So therefore, it is a way of um, interoperating between multiple blockchains. Uh, so the Lightning Network can work across many independent blockchains to send payments from one chain to another. Um, and uh, just a note here, uh, so if you think about these payment channels as uh, fundamentally being about signed checkpoints and recovery, then um, you can see that maybe there are other ways to improve the, uh, the, the throughput of a Lightning Network. So the problem with hash locks is that, uh, the problem with hash locks in a complex Lightning Network is that the inner, inner links the, uh, uh, might have too many uh, concurrent transactions that are going through. And then what that does is it makes uh, dispute resolution more expensive because when something happens, uh, in that inner link and there's a dispute, then you have to settle that dispute by kind of dumping all the 
the, the ongoing transaction state. So instead, what you can do is for fungible coin payments, you can, you can send little pennies and see that it went to the other side and then keep sending it. So in this case, you're, you're changing the, the solution into something that's more about, um, uh, uh, that requires a, a credit buffer between these payment channels. Uh, so it's just another way to look at how Lightning Network might work. Um, so going back to what I was saying earlier, whenever you have multiple parties, you have an asynchronicity problem. Um, so state channels and payment channels are generally done with bilateral connections, and you can link them together to make a network or chain. But uh, at some point, you know, many applications require multiple parties. Uh, so whenever you have multiple parties, you're going to have a, a, a pretty bad asynchronicity problem. Um, so what you probably need is a, or what you probably want is BFT consensus so that even though, say, a, up to a third of the actors and signers are offline, you can still come to consensus. Um, uh, of course, there are other ways to do this. Uh, Plasma, for example, is a way to scale um, to off-chain transactions and still have some kind of fault uh, recovery mechanism. But that comes with uh, the issue of the complexity and cost of fault recovery on, on the root chain. So you have this trade-off between uh, quick uh, finality with uh, uh, dealing with asynchronous issues by just saying, okay, you only need, say, two-thirds to sign off versus complete um, fault recovery, but then you have the complexity of uh, the actual fault recovery mechanism so complex uh, dispute resolution protocols. And then you also have, uh, an issue, uh, you, you may also have issues with uh, long delays because you need to give time for that dispute resolution to, to occur. So if you, just, if you just have a BFT side chain, then uh, you, know, you don't have to necessarily wait for too long for fault recovery because you just say, oh, there was a commit. So this can happen every five seconds in the case of like a tenement blockchain. Okay. so. I just talked about atomic cross-chain transactions and, and payment channels and state channels, but uh, going to BFT systems, you can actually have two BFT blockchains uh, literally connect to each other and be aware of each other. Um, so this is a different kind of interoperability between blockchains. Um, and this is uh, what we are innovating at, uh, with the Cosmos network. And the idea is that the Cosmos hub that we're about to launch soon is this blockchain that's responsible for connecting to many sidechains, so to speak. We call them zones. Um, but uh, the way that these two, the way that the one blockchain, say the hub, talks to uh, the sidechain is by, um, by doing this. So first, you prove to uh, the other blockchain that you know, this is a block hash that was committed. And then from that block hash, you can find a Merkle proof down to anything that you want to prove. And so uh, the receiving blockchain can know for sure that the sending blockchain intended to send something to this blockchain, a packet, for example. Uh, here's just a better uh, image that, uh, that kind of shows what's going on. So you see in the green, the green section over here is the, uh, is the block commit. So these are signatures. Uh, more than two-thirds of voting power that prove that block hash number 100 is something. And then from that block hash, you can have a Merkle root down to some, something that you want to prove. Uh, it doesn't have to be a packet. It can also just be state. So you can, you can have all kinds of interesting uh, interchain communication that involves not just uh, sending information that needs to be processed in sequence, but it can also be uh, reading the state of another chain to do something with it. So there's a lot of flexibility here. Um, so this is just what I said. Um, and the reason why I think BFT systems, uh, classical BFT systems like Tendermint, PBFT, are interesting is because uh, it allows for efficient and very fast uh, inter blockchain communication. And so uh, the fundamentally, it's similar to the concept of if you have a mobile phone, um, the phone can, can be aware of the consensus, that, uh, consensus set or the validator set of a chain and be convinced, uh, even though it's not communicating to any of the validators directly, it can be convinced through the signatures that, okay, the blockchain committed this. So the, the idea of IBC is to extend that so that blockchains themselves and their state machines are literally like clients of each other. 
Okay, so once you have, you know, in the context of IBC, there are various things to consider for scaling and security, so let's talk about that. Um, and the basis, uh, you know, we can think of two chains as having completely independent validator sets with their own staking token, so to speak. Um, so there are some things to consider here. So you can have chain A and chain B connected to each other. Uh, so let's talk about chain failure. When one of the chains fails, um, there's several ways you can deal with this in general, and here are four um, that are at least on the top of my mind. So number one, you can just choose not to do anything uh, and say, okay, this chain failed. It doesn't have two-thirds that are you know, coming to agreement, and therefore those tokens are gone. It's kind of um, like what Bitcoin likes to do when a multi-sig account you know, doesn't have funds anymore, and it's what Ethereum Classic would want to do for a smart contract where the funds are no longer accessible. So that's one solution. Uh, another is to try to decrease the amount of uh, voting power required uh, to sign off on a block commit, on a block hash over time. So initially, during nominal operation, you might require two-thirds to sign off to convince yourself that that was the block hash that was committed. But over time, uh, if, if there hasn't been any activity, you can think of ways to you know, slowly decrease that threshold over time. So you might say you only need 51% or maybe even lower, although there are problems once you go lower because of the potential for double signing issues or, or forking issues uh, without, without stake. Um, another way is to say, okay, this chain this side chain failed, so let's revert to some sort of governance system or, or delegate it to someone. So um, manual intervention is certainly another option. Um, I, I think that um, using governance proposals to solve these issues is probably the right way to go in the beginning because there are a lot of edge cases to consider and, and uh, programming these solutions take time and we don't know all the edge cases. So I think it's probably the right way to go in the beginning, but over time we'll find ways to automate these things. Um, there's another way uh, to, to just decide automatically without manual intervention what to do in the case of a, a sidechain failure. And that is, you can do something like this. You can say, okay, here's a sidechain B, and it has some, some stakeholders or, or signers, uh, and it, it's not coming to consensus anymore, so you, there's no two-thirds assigning a, 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 the same block hash. So for, what you can do is for a period of time, you can collect, um, votes from all the signers of that failed chain as to which block hash should be uh, what, what, uh, what this side chain re, uh, resumes on from the perspective of this my chain. Uh, so for a fixed duration of time, say a day, a week, uh, one hour, what have you, you can have all the signers uh, uh, commit to exactly one choice of many potential ways to fork. And then, as long as, uh, as, long as you know, the, the person doing the tallying is deterministic, um, then you, at the end of that period, you can come to a conclusion and say, well, this block hash had the most votes, so we're going to go with that one. The problem is who or what is responsible for tallying the votes. Um, so there are various choices here. You can do it on chain A itself, so I can be the one that does the tallying. But this doesn't work in the case of like the Cosmos hub in a hub and spoke model, because now what you're saying is in the case of say the Cosmos hub forking, if the hub itself has consensus failure, you're, you're kind of delegating to all of the individual zones, the side chains, what to do. And there are you know, potentially edge cases with, uh, with you know, griefing or trolling signers that are revealing votes at just the right time to cause the side chains to come to different decisions about which hub fork to decide on. So instead, what you can do is you can say the Cosmos hub might delegate um, this, this ability uh, of coming to uh, a reorg consensus to another chain. It might be a, a very simple chain with, a, with an independent validator set, ideally. Um, that uh, its only job is to tally votes during a period of time and come to deterministic consensus. So if the Cosmos hub fails, uh, all of the side chains can listen to this recovery chain and look out for what decision is made there. So it's another option. 
Okay, I want to talk about uh, scaling. So um, it's not clear, I think it's not clear to a lot of people how uh, we intend to scale uh, computation ability into Cosmos Network. Um, and uh, this is one way to do it. It's called uh, replicated shared security. Uh, the idea is that for a given validator set, like the Cosmos Hub validator set, but it could be a different validator set, that set, um, that signing set, can be responsible for not just one blockchain, but many, many blockchains. Um, and so, uh, in other words, every one of these validators uh, on in the validator set would will be running the same. Uh, would be running a rack of servers, uh, and and you know they would all come to consensus together on on every single one of these blockchain shards, so to speak. Um, there are many ways to you know think about security here, but I think the simplest way is to say if you do something wrong in any one of these um, shards or child chains or what have you. Um, then you get punished on a single chain that keeps track of the mutations of the validator set for that entire set. So you might have a master chain, um, and then you might have many replicas or slave chains. And it's all the same validator set, but only one of these chains is responsible for ultimately updating, uh, slashing, and so on. The reason why you want this, especially for a, a delegated proof of stake system, is because um, you know, the, uh, the, the information, all that state about delegation kind of needs to live on one chain. Um, uh, it, you can't really port that over to many replicas. I don't think it really makes sense. Uh, it's, it's a lot of computation to deal with delegation. Um, so like the Cosmos Hub might support 10,000 delegators. So it makes sense for the Cosmos Hub to be the root or the master chain that handles delegation and slashing in the case of double signing across all of the replicas. Um, and then uh, the idea is that through IBC, you can communicate from the master chain to the replica chains how the validator set has changed on the master chain. Um, so taking this concept of, of sharding further with the replicated uh, validator set, you can think of offering uh, validation as a service. So say a validator set with 21 validators, for example, they might offer uh, a hosting of blockchain applications. So, you know, uh, if you build your blockchain on the Cosmos SDK or, or what have you on Ethermint, uh, you, you still have to decide who's going to be the validator for this blockchain. Well, if there's a service, a validator as a service uh, offering, then you can just host it there. And there are many ways to, to pay for that. So I, I won't go into the details there, but uh, I, th I think it's pretty clear how the system can scale. Uh, and then, you know, going into uh, other models, um, there are ways to sample from a set of signers. So you can have a validator set that has like 10,000 participants, and then you can uh, somehow select a sample or sortition of the larger set to be validating uh, on one of the shards. Um, so a lot of projects are approaching, uh, are trying to solve uh, this, this method of scaling. The, it's got pros and cons, so it's, it's, it's fast because you, know, you don't have to come to consensus with all 10,000 signers, but on the other hand, you have less at stake for every chain. Um, but you know, there are various combinations that are possible, so um, lots more to explore there. Um, here's a plug. Uh, so we're, we're launching the Cosmos Hub pretty soon, and um, after launch uh, of the Cosmos Hub, we'll be implementing uh, uh, some of the features uh, that I mentioned here, including shared security with replicated validators um, and, and pegging to, to existing blockchains like Ethereum and Bitcoin. So uh, it's going to be a good time. Please join us. Thank you. Thank you.